Well, good morning. Good morning. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I want to welcome you to Covenant Presbyterian Church as we gather here to worship. My name is Italo. That's Italo Furieri. Uh, don't let my Texan accent fool you. I'm, I'm not from around here. I am the pastor here at Covenant Presbyterian Church, and I'm very glad that you would join us this morning as we gather to worship the King, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And to uh, help you prepare your heart for worship, there is a verse printed for you there on the cover of your worship guide. Let me invite you as we have a prelude for you to turn your attention to that and for you to calm your hearts and your minds and quiet them down for worship. always the Lord who calls us to worship. So if you please stand as we read the call to worship. It is printed there on your worship guide and we will read responsively. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Increase the days of the king's life, his ears for many generations. May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. Lord, we have been called by you to come, to come and seek refuge under your tent, under your wings, to dwell in your tent forever. Lord, to rejoice in the kingship of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we come. He is the one. He is the one who has ascended to the highest heavens, who has then given us your Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in whom we count. We enter the temple of God. It is by him we enjoy your presence in our midst, and by him we have become your temple. We then call upon you that we may feel and sense and be touched and be transformed by your presence in this place, Lord. We continue to ask for these things, even praying that prayer which your Son himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the glory forever. Amen. Then we sing, How Great Thou Art. God is great. So let's sing. Yeah. 
consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Heavenly Father, it is good, it is good for us to be reminded at the beginning of yet another week of your greatness. Lord, your greatness in your grace for us. Lord, that when we think that you did not spare your son, but sent him to die. It is true, we scarce can take it in. But then, it is true, we are reminded of it again. And we come into your courts then with the praise due your name. The one whose grace is to be praised for the magnitude of its glory. For who? For us. For us, Lord. Oh, Lord, that 
by the blood of your son, our adoration might be pleasing in your sight. We praise your name in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we continue then just declaring the greatness of God, of who he is, and the work that he has done. And we do that now by confessing our faith. For all of those who would hear, whoever is in the earshot of us, we're going to say now, what is it that we believe? And we do that in a very special way this morning in particular, because we are saying the same things that the church, those who believe in Christ, those who have gathered to worship together have said for thousands of years. And it's right here it's in the Nicene Creed, and we will read together. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Beloved, in response to that, let's sing to God be the glory. And I want to point out to you that there is a second part of that on the next page. So the hymn is in two pages. So inconveniently for you, you're going to have to turn uh, back and forth from that. But let's sing together to God be the glory. Glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that we may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer, of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus forgiveness receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and 
us we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Let us pray. Gracious Father, the earth is yours in the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. In your hand are the depths of the earth, and the heights of the mountains are yours also. The sea is yours, for you made it, and your hands form the dry land. Every beast of the forest is yours, and the cattle on a thousand hills. You are therefore a great king, and a great king above all gods. You made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes, and being in pomp they did not understand, and therefore did not remain, but became like the beasts that perish. Out of the depths, we who have called to you, O Lord, and you have heard our vows and given us the heritage of those who fear your name. Blessed be God, who has not rejected our prayers or removed his steadfast love from us. Father, we pray for our pastor, for our elders, and for our deacons. Make them competent in the scriptures, that from them they may be equipped for every good work and teaching, showing integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. Please bring to this church the families in the neighborhood who have not heard the call of the gospel, that they may repent and receive Jesus as their Savior. Please establish more Reformed churches here in the valley and provide more Reformed pastors to preach your word. Please keep blessing and expanding Pastor Gama's church plant in Edinburgh. Father, please extend your mercy and blessings on those who are hurting. Please guide the doctors who are treating Jimmy's back and enable him to heal. Please be with Janet as she cares for her dad, who's very sick. Please bless and protect Allison's pregnancy. Please provide David Archibald with a job in the valley. Please provide traveling mercies for all those who are traveling this summer season. Please bless Al with the comfort of your presence. Please soften the hearts of those in our families who have not accepted Jesus as their Savior. Father, prepare our hearts to receive your word. Help us to put away our worldly concerns and to immerse our minds in the purifying power of Scripture. Enable Pastor Idolo to boldly preach your word with power and clarity. Father, please teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Also, train us in whatever situation we are to be content. Let us know how to be brought low and how to abound in any and every circumstance. Let us learn the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, and that godliness with contentment is a great gain to us, and a little with fear of the Lord and quietness is better than great treasure and trouble with it. Let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you are paying attention to our service, to this worship that we have, you've noticed that our entire service, it's like a huge, continuous altar call. That's what our service is. We come before God and we are just taken by his glory and his power and his majesty and his love so we sing praises and then we come into this part which just like in the lord's prayer instead of going first to the forgiveness of sins we go to that which god knows we need which is bread everyday bread he knows we are made of dust he knows we we have fallen from that which he created us for he knows our needs so we we pray with petitions and intercession but then we are reminded of that which we need most. As we just sang a few minutes ago, that we would bring our sins to Jesus and receive forgiveness. Now, that's what we do. We confess our sins. And it's printed for you there in your worship guide. I'm going to say the first part and you will answer. And it's our prayer of confession. 
Our Heavenly Father, we are your people, and yet we often continue to walk in the ways of this fallen world. We are your people, and yet we often live as if we have no hope. We are still in great need of your renewing grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, beloved, you personally go to the Lord in prayer in silent confession. The word of the Lord never leaves us without assurance of forgiveness. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from, the, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Beloved, in light of such a wonderful grace, let's stand and let's sing together, My Jesus, I love thee. <laughs> If you would open your Bibles in the book of Numbers, book of Numbers chapter 6, book of Numbers chapter 6, we return now to this series on the book of Numbers, 
And we're going to read number 6, verses 1 through 21. Now, this passage, it uh, carries a lot of weight uh, theologically. It carries a lot of weight for you to learn and understand what's going on in the rest of Scripture and what has happened so far. So lest you feel as though you dropped in this passage with a parachute, you know, and you don't know what's going on, I want to do a quick recap of what's going on so you'll understand the place of this passage in the book of Numbers, but also the place of this passage perhaps even in all of Scripture. So in Genesis, God created Adam and Eve in his own image, and he placed them in the Garden of Eden. And what, what do you call the place where you put images of God? Well, the place where you put images of God is a temple. So earth, earth is meant to be God's temple. And Eden, the Garden of Eden, was the most holy place of the temple. That was where man and woman, they would meet with God and they would walk with God there. And after man sinned, man was exiled from God's presence. And he was sent east, east of Eden. And the eastern entrance to the Garden of Eden was guarded by an angelic host who would kill anyone who attempted to enter there. And from that moment on, from that point on, the history of the world, the history of the world has been the history of this. How will mankind return to the Holy of Holies and fulfill his purpose of spreading God's glory, God's holy of holies, God's image all over the earth. How is he going to fulfill his purpose of spreading Eden, the Garden of Eden, all over the earth? And with the goal, with the goal of creating this new humanity, God called Abraham. And he promised to Abraham that he would make Abraham into this new humanity. That he would multiply Abraham and he would be like the host of heaven. Like the sand on the seashore. And that his people would be his people. Like God would be their God and his offspring would be his offspring. And he would dwell in their midst. That was the promise to Abraham. Well, then hundreds of years went by. Hundreds of years. Now, Abraham's children are numerous. But they are also slaves. In Egypt, and God comes to free them from captivity, to free them from slavery. That's the Exodus. About a month after they leave Egypt, a month later, they arrive at Mount Sinai, all the people and their children. Now, in the Garden of Eden, you had, you know, the Garden of Eden where God had built the garden on earth. That was the place of meeting. That's where man and woman met with God. Now that they are in Mount Sinai, where are they going to meet with God? Well, God shows Moses in Exodus and commands him to build a sanctuary. Make for me a sanctuary that I may dwell in the midst of the people. Then through Moses, God gave his people instructions on how to build the tabernacle. That's the tent of meeting. And it was meant, the tabernacle was meant to resemble and symbolize the Garden of Eden. The entrance of the tent was facing east. And when you entered through the tent and you walked through the yard of the tent, through the holy place, and you arrived at the most holy place, you were traveling west as if you were going back to the garden. That's the tabernacle. It symbolizes a return to Eden. Ten months after God showed him the tabernacle, ten months after leaving Egypt, rather, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, is completed. And at the end of the completion of the tent, uh, Moses cannot enter it. He cannot enter it. 
That's when the book of Leviticus begins. And that takes about a month. Something happens in the book of Leviticus that then allows Moses to enter the tent of meeting. That's the establishment of the priests and of the sacrifices. And now, now about 11 or 12 months after having left Egypt, about 11 or 12 months after the Red Sea opened, Moses, in the beginning of the book of Numbers, he is in the tent of meeting. He is in the tent. In Numbers chapters 1 through 10, it, take, it, it only covers the period of time of about 20 days. 20 days. And in these 20 days, what is God doing? Well, he's preparing his people to trek a very dangerous and perilous wilderness on their way to the promised land. The trip to the land of Canaan from, where, from Mount Sinai should have taken about two to three weeks. But then, as we're going to see through the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers is not going to cover two to three weeks of history. It's going to cover 40 years of history. So stay tuned. Something is going to happen. It's not going to be today, but something is coming. Now, here in Numbers 1 through 6, God, what is God doing? He is setting up his camp, and he is providing his people, and that includes you and I, you and me. He's providing us with a living image of what the life of God's people will be like from this moment on. Since the Garden of Eden and the fall of mankind, what you have before you on Numbers 1 through 6 is the first time God has dwelt among his people. It is a very important moment in the history of the congregation of God. This is the first time. Once again, Numbers 1 through 6, God dwells in the midst of his people. It is as if it, it is the down payment of the new garden of Eden. And Numbers 1 through 6 gives us the first expression of the new humanity. What's this new humanity to be like? A new people returning to walk with God in his temple. This is the beginning of the renewal of all creation. Right here. Numbers 1 through 6. And for those who want to be closer to God, for those who want to be closer to God, in Numbers 1 through 6, what you have is, this is how you do it. This is how you do it, right here. If you want to see the first biblical picture of what life is to be like with God living in your midst, Numbers 1 through 6 is the standard, is the paradigm. And to make the picture even clearer for us, to make that picture even clearer, in Numbers 5 and 6, God presents us with two cases, two cases concerning God's personal relationship with his people. There is a negative case, and we, we saw this several months ago, and it is equated to your personal relationship with God, and it's... God gives it to us negatively. He says, do not be like an unfaithful wife. Do not be like an unfaithful wife. You're not going to relate to me as an unfaithful wife. Do not do that. By the way, this is the first time in Scripture where this is it. This is where the metaphor of God's relationship with his people being of that of a husband and a wife comes in. It's right here in Numbers 1 through 6. And then finally... We have come to our passage today. Number six. If you are not to be like an unfaithful wife in your personal relationship with God, well, who are you to be like? Well, you are to be like a Nazarite. That's what you have on Numbers 6, 1 to 21. You're going to be like a Nazarite. As we read the passage here, this, I want you to keep this in mind. Keep this in mind. The Nazarite is the Old Testament picture of what every 
disciple of Jesus should be. And like our title says, the title for the sermon this morning, like our title says there, this passage is for those who want to be closer to God. This is a passage for those who want to be closer to God. So as we get ready to read, let me pray and we'll read. Heavenly Father, by your power, sustain us as we get into this passage, Lord. Speak to us, O Lord, that we may be even closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So here we go. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink, and shall not drink any juice or grapes or eat grapes, fresh or dried. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall touch his head. Until the time is completed for which he separates himself from the Lord, he shall be holy. He shall let the locks of, his, of the of hair of his head grow long. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. Not even for his father or for his mother, for brother or sister, if they die, shall he, be made, shall he make himself unclean, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation he is holy to the Lord. And if any man dies very suddenly beside him, and he defiles his consecrated head, then he shall shave his head on the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day he shall shave it. On the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves or two pigeons to the priest to the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and make atonement for him because he sinned by reason of the dead body. And he shall consecrate his head that same day and separate himself to the Lord for the days of his separation and bring a male lamb a year old for a guilt offering. But, he, but the previous period shall be void because his separation was defiled. And this is the law for the Nazarite, when the time of his separation has been completed. He shall be brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and he shall bring his gift to the Lord, one male lamb a year old without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb a year old without blemish as a sin offering, and one ram without blemish as a peace offering, and a basket of unleavened bread, loaves of fine flour mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and their grain offering and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord and offer his sin offering and his burnt offering, and he shall offer the ram as a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall offer also its grain offering and its drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave his consecrated head at the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall take the hair from his consecrated head and put it on the fire that is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. And the priest shall take the shoulder of the ram when it's boiled and one unleavened loaf out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them on the hands of the Nazarite after he has shaved the hair of his consecration. And the priest shall wave them before for a wave offering before the Lord. They are a holy portion for the priest together with the breast that is waved and the thigh that is contributed. And after that... After that, the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite. But if he vows an offering to the Lord above his Nazarite vow, as he can afford, in exact accordance with the vow that he takes, then he shall do in addition to the law of the Nazarite. Well, this is God's holy, inerrant, infallible word. May, it be, may its truth be written in our hearts too. So, what do Christians want most in this life? Why do Americans 
go to church. So these are the titles of two surveys that I looked at to gain some insight on just that. What is it that you want here this morning? What is it that you came here looking for? And based on that study, what I expect if I were to repeat that survey here this morning is that I would ask you, so what did you hear for this morning? I, I, I'd expect nine out of, of, out of ten of each one of you to say that the thing that you want more than anything else in life is to be closer to God. That's nine out of ten of you here today. Now, even if you're here today as a nominal Christian, a nominal Christian, what is a nominal Christian? A nominal Christian is a Christian in name only. He's a, a Christian who probably wouldn't be able to explain to me what, what even is a Christian. Even those, even those, if you're here this morning just because you're following tradition, would you, 65 out of 100 of you came here this morning to be closer to God. Then there was a follow-up question to that in the survey that said, choose the most important reason, the most important reason why you attend a religious service. Six out of 10 said, I attend a religious service most of all to become closer to God. Six out of 10. That wasn't even a close second. That, that wasn't a close second. Uh, one of the, the other ones caught my attention because it, it was only four in 100. Only four in 100 churchgoers said that the sermon is their favorite part of the service. So I'm in a tough spot. Uh, I'm in a tough spot. Yeah, so I digress. If you like to take notes, there's some blanks for you there in your worship guide, and your first blank is coming up. All this survey shows us, and this is what this passage is for, is your first blank there on your worship guide. You can start filling them in. What God's people want most is to be closer to God. That's what God people, God's people want most. And if you are here today, this is what you're here to to do. You came here because the thing that you want to do is to be closer to God. And this is what the Nazarite passage is about. God has set up his entire camp revealing to his people his goal. His goal is that they would be closer to him. Their sinfulness has created a separation between God and his people, but now the entire camp organization in Numbers 1 through 6 culminates with the Nazarite vow, which is bringing someone closer to him. How can a man or a woman have communion with God in God's tent? The Nazarite vow. Through the Nazarite vow, someone from the camp, they could get as close to God as it was possible at the time. And that's the main point that I want to make. It's your next blank there. If you want to be closer to God, the only way is the Nazarite way. If you want to be closer to God, the only way is the Nazarite way. If you look again with me on verse 18, what you see on verse 18 is this. And the Nazarite shall shave his consecrated head at the entrance of the tent of meeting. See, he's at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and he shaves his head. And then he shall, he shall take the hair from his head, and he puts it on the fire that is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. Did you catch that? This is the only time when someone other than a priest deposits something on the altar. The, first, the only time. The Nazarite gets to walk as far west as possible in the camp of Israel, in, inside the tent of meeting. And there is more. The hair is placed under the peace offering. You know what the peace offering is? The peace offering is for the, the one who is bringing it to eat a portion of it right there at the tent with the priest and with God, at God's house. This is the goal for all of God's people, that they will be closer to God, 
that they would have fellowship with him as he used to be in the Garden of Eden. A restored humanity to a restored world is like the Nazarites. That's the only way to live there. And maybe, maybe, what many of you have thought or even think still when you read this passage of the Nazarite is this, that this law of the Nazarite is certainly not for me. This is only for a few out there, maybe. Maybe those in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, this doesn't apply to me anymore. And, and certainly doesn't apply to me in particular because this is for special people. This is for people who make vows and think, I can obey, I can fulfill this vow, so I'm going to make this vow. Maybe that's what you think. The Nazarites are just special people. But did you pay attention to what the verse, to what the beginning of the law of the Nazarites says? Look again at verses 1 and 2 with me. Look at that. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel, not a particular tribe, not a particular tribe. Speak to all of them and say this. When either a man or a woman, it's not even just a man, a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself for the Lord. Anyone can make this vow. <laughs> All are invited to come closer to God. It is for everyone. And I've said this, keep this in mind, the Nazarite is the prototype of the disciple of Jesus. That's what a disciple of Jesus is like. He's like the Nazarite. And if you want to be closer to God, the only way is the Nazarite way. Well, what is, what is the way of the Nazarite then? Let's get into this. It's your next blank there. It's your first point. It's the way of separation and consecration. That's what the word means. Nazarite, what does that word even mean? Separated, consecrated, holy. That's the way of the Nazarite. The Nazarite is a living and prophetic picture of, of one who is closer to God, who is drawing nearer and nearer to God. It's what God wants his people to see and think, ah, oh, that's it. That's a picture of what God wants me to be in relation to him. The Nazarite illustrates that which husbands and wives do when they get married. When we make vows to each other, what a husband and wife are saying is this, I am fully separate. I am consecrated to you. I have forsaken all others for you. And that's what the Nazarite vow does. This is the Nazarite way. Here's your next blank. The Nazarite way is to give up the fallen world for the kingdom of God. He gives up the fallen world for the kingdom of God. And if you are wondering, what does those stipulations of the vow uh, point to? You know, the wine and the razor and the, uh, uh, the dead bodies. What does that point to? It points to that, to separation, to giving up the fallen world for the kingdom of God. To be closer to God then, you must be, here's your next blank. You must be separated in the way you rest. If you were thinking that you must be separated in the way you drink, you're wrong. It's, you must be separated in the way you rest. That's the stipulation about not drinking wine. As a matter of fact, as a Nazarite, you couldn't consume not even the seeds or the skins of the grapes, not, not even a raisin. The wine and the fruit of the vine in several parts of Scripture they point to this idea of rest, and they do so in a variety of ways. Once you get to the promised land, the promised land flows with milk, honey, and wine. That's what the promised land flows with. The rest of the people, the way they're going to rest, can come only from the promised land. That's what the Nazarite is showing us. <laughs> can only come from the promised land when it is conquered, which means when God rests as the king of that land. Would you be surprised if I told you that the hallmark, the hallmark of Canaanite culture 
the thing they did the best. That which you find most when you excavate Canaan concerning what were the lives of the Canaanites like. The hallmark of their culture was beer and wine. They were great at that. They were drunkards to the utmost. They were constantly merry and regularly drunk. And they lived, so here's what they did. They lived in the land of God. Who does this land belong to? God. And they lived there as if it was their land. No one is ever going to take it from us. Well, the Nazarites, they were to be separate from this. They are not to act as those who are resting now. They are not to rest yet. They are only going to rest in the promised land. That's the Nazarite. And it's not hard for us to understand this relationship, right, of, uh, of, of rest and wine. It's really not hard. Did you ever have a job where you could drink on duty? No. The bell strikes. You can finally rest. You probably have a drink. It's time to rest. And you know that if it's Tuesday and you rest too much, you're going to be hungover on Wednesday. You drank on duty. We understand this only too well. Too well. So, wine and rest. We are not to rest like everyone else. We're to be separated. So what do we get from all this? Obviously, there is the relationship of rest and alcohol and drugs, how people in our culture, and some of us here, have often sought for rest and forgetfulness and whatever comfort it is, whatever rest it is on some kind of alcohol or drug. It's, it's part of our culture. But then, youth, young ones, look at me. Young ones. It also involves video games, doesn't it? Video games. When I'm playing a video game, ah, oh, isn't that true? I forget everything. I don't, if I don't think about anything, I'm resting. That could be a wine. That's how the world works. And I'm, I'm very, it's unfortunate for me to report to you that adults do that too. I've lost count now of how many adults are on their phone. And what are they doing? Playing a game. Why? Because huh, no, I don't have to think about anything. So I'm resting. I'm just getting drunk on whatever it is that it will take my mind away from things. But it could be anything. It could be binge watching TV, it could be Netflix, it could be, it could be retirement. It could be these ideas, these grandiose ideas that you have for retirement. Well, when I retire, I'm going to rest right here on this earth. I'm going to travel and see the world. <laughs> it's rest. I'm going to rest like everybody else. That's what everybody does when they retire. I'm going to rest. And the way of the Nazarite is to be separate on the way they rest. Because the rest is in the promised land. It is not here. Two to three weeks. Two to three weeks. That's how long it's going to take to arrive there. And if, if God is fighting for you, this victory is going to be quick because that's what happened in Egypt. Quick victory. I'm gonna, I'm, I came, I got you out of here super quick. Beloved, you cannot rest here. You got to wait. You got to wait until you're in the promised land. You got to wait until you are at the presence of Jesus sitting on his throne. Then you're going to rest. If you try to rest now, like everybody else is trying to do, it is as if you are in the midst of the wilderness, in a desolate place, and you found a bottle of wine. And you just said, I'm going to give myself to this rest. This is my rest right now, right here in the middle of the desert. I'm going to drink this bottle of wine. And how many of us have become victims of that sin? Not separate like the Nazarite. Next, to be closer to God, you must be separated in your relationship. That's your next blank. You must be separated in your relationship priorities. You must be separated in your relationship priorities. This is what the stipulation concerning the dead bodies points us to. That's what it points us to. That even if your loved ones were to die, you could not go to the funeral. You could not break your Nazarite vow. What is this doing? This right here 
is the crucible. Is the crucible that sees, that reveals to us, that tests which relationship in our lives has the highest priority. That's what that stipulation is meant to do. The Nazarite is separated in his relationship priorities. This seems so harsh to us. But we know we understand this so well because we know how certain relationships in our lives, especially those of our loved ones, especially the relationships that we have with fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, sons, and daughters, we know too well how those relationships, they just encroach into our personal relationship with God. A pastor tells a story of a husband whom he was counseling in his marriage. And then the pastor says, well, to obey God, mister, you have to do this thing. And the response of the husband was, oh, if I do this thing to obey God, my wife will leave me. To what the natural question is, then what are you going to do? It is the crucible that shows where your heart really is. You must be separated in the relationship priorities. Who is really pulling on the strings of your heart? Is it God? To be closer to God, you must be separated. Here's your next blank. You must be separated in your whole way of life. In your whole way of life. And this is about the shaving of the head. The shaving of the head. So who is it at the time when this was written that had the metallurgical, you know, the metal, the metal technology to make such a blade so sharp that you could cut your hair, you know, shave your hair without cutting your skin. Who had this technology at the time? Oh, the Egyptians did. It was great technology. And pretty soon here in our story in Numbers, the people of God are going to say, oh, if we, why did we leave Egypt? Why did we leave that high culture of Egypt? Do you remember? They had like pots of meat. Oh, delicious cucumbers and razors. Mm, just shade, let's just smooth razors for our skin. I mean, there's nothing wrong with technology. But what the raising, the, ra the razor to the head clearly demonstrates is there's a lifestyle here. There's a culture. There's a culture here that you're just giving yourself to, and you're to be separate from that. Any culture that is not shaped by the word of God, you are to be separate from it. Because any culture that is not shaped by the word of God is, is kind of like a rip current. A rip current. Here's the public service announcement for this morning, okay? Public service announcement. Everybody pay attention. This is important for your life because you live close to the beach now. You live close to the beach, and when you go to the beach, there's this thing that is responsible for 80% of all the rescues at the beach. It's the rip current. What is the rip current? It's this narrow current that because of the wave, the shifting sands, the, the tides and the wind, it forms. And this current is just going inwards to the ocean. And it will suck you in so fast that if you try to swim against it, you're going to get tired so quickly. Next thing you know, you're drowning. So how do you escape a rip current? Very simple. You swim sideways. Because remember, it's just a narrow little current pulling you in. You swim sideways, you're out of it. That's the same thing you are to do with any culture that is not shaped by the word of God. Because you will suck you in so quickly. You need to be separate from it. To be closer to God. Or you will drown in that culture. Away 
from the Lord. There's more that the hair does, but who are we kidding? I don't have time to tell you all. So to be closer to God, that's the way of the Nazarite. It's a way of separation and consecration. But here's what you just learned in this first point, really. What you've learned right now is not how wonderful and strong and sinless you are in fulfilling your vows. You've learned about your sin. You've learned about your weakness. You've learned how many times you actually did try to fulfill vows, but you didn't. What you've learned on this first point is you have failed. You failed to be separate in your whole lifestyle. You failed to be separate in your relationship priorities. You failed to be separate in the way you rest. Well, beloved, then you'll be glad to know that the Nazarites didn't make these vows because they thought, oh, I have faith in myself to fulfill these vows. No, that's not why. They, they did that because of this next point. And it's our second point there in your next blank. It is the way of separation and consecration, but it's also the way of faith. The way of faith in the sacrifices. It is the way of faith in the sacrifices. You know, verses 9 through 12 kind of hint at that. What would happen to a Nazarite if he accidentally fell off from his vow? There was a sacrifice to reset. There was a sacrifice to start again. He believed that. The Nazarite believed that. He's like, ha, this sacrifice is the sacrifice God provided. It is going to cleanse me from my sin. It is going to purify me. I get to reset. But then at the end, at the end of the vow, what was at the end of the vow? Lots and lots of sacrifices. And that's where the Nazarite believed in the sacrifice. Had faith on those. Did you notice there's an order, right? There's an order there for how they are presented. First, the priest burns the sin offering. What does the sin offering represent? Forgiveness of sins. Cleans expiation of sins. You cannot touch anything that belongs to God for as long as your sins are not expiated. If your sins are not forgiven, can't touch anything. You need to be cleansed from those. Sin offering does that. The next offering, the whole burnt offering, also known as the ascension, uh, the ascension offering. What does that represent? On that offering, you burn the whole animal completely, completely. And it ascends to the presence of God as a sweet, pleasing aroma to him. What does that mean? That means that sacrifice purifies you. You are pure. The fire has consumed all of your impurities. You are cleansed. You are pure, like, like pure gold now, like the purest of metals. And you can ascend to the presence of God. And then comes the peace offering, which is eat with me now. You have peace with God. You have fellowship with God in his house. That's what the sacrifices represented. That's what carries the Nazarite as far west as he can get. And then he eats there with God. He's in the garden. Well, of course. Of course. This is Sunday morning at a Christian church. What do these sacrifices point us to? To Jesus. To Jesus Christ. This is what we believe. Look at your worship guide there. There's a, a question there from the Westminster Larger Catechism. And there's a couple blanks for you to fill in. And this is the question. How was the covenant of grace administered under the Old Testament? How was it administered under the Old Testament? Answer, the covenant of grace was administered under the Old Testament by promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, the Passover, and other types and ordinances, which did all, all, all of them for signify Christ, Christ, then to come, pointed to Christ in the future. And were for that time sufficient. Oh, at that time, it was sufficient for the Nazarite to build up his faith, the elect in faith, 
in the promised Messiah by whom they then had full remission of sin and eternal salvation. This is it. This explains why the Nazarite was able to make such vows. He believed the sacrifices. That's what he did. It was by faith. Here's a question for you. Are you afraid of making vows to God? Are you fearful of saying to God, I will live a fully consecrated, holy life before you? Are you afraid of that? If you are, well, you need to believe the sacrifice of Jesus. That's the only way. Make your vows day by day. Fulfill your vows. Failed on your vows? Come and get forgiveness. Present the sacrifice, which is what? Faith in Christ. Start again every day. Every day. Every day. Every Sunday. Start again. Who, who, what other people on earth have such promises? There's no one, beloved. There's no one. Well, if you want to be closer to God, there it is. It's the way, the only way is the way of the Nazarite. Separation and consecration. The way of faith and the sacrifices. And then finally, our final point there, the way of following the perfect. That's your next blank. The perfect Nazarite. The way of following the perfect Nazarite. Did you get that on verse 21? Look at verse 21 again with me. This is the law of the Nazarite. But if he vows an offering to the Lord above his Nazarite vow, as he can afford in exact accordance with the vow that he takes, then he shall do in addition to the law of the Nazarite. There are several Nazarites, several other Nazarites in Scripture, okay? Several others who did exactly. I mean, this is the evidence in Scripture. They did exactly what this verse right here is talking about. But a perfect one comes to mind. Perfect one comes to mind. And your final blank there is your favorite Sunday school answer is his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the one who opened for you and for me eternally the way of the Nazarite. He did that. I know that's true because you no longer have to bring lambs and rams and, and goats and, and birds and fire. You come in his name. He opened the way for us. And he's the absolute fulfillment of these sacrifices. But he is also the perfect Nazarite. I think it is evident to us that Jesus did what this verse 621 is talking about. That he vowed something above his Nazarite vow. And he was something that he, only he, could afford. Let me show you. Mark 14, 25, Jesus said this. Truly I say to you. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. It sounds a lot like a Nazarite vow. I will not touch the fruit of the vine until that day. Well, a few hours after saying this, it is a mystery to me exactly how. It seems as though he fulfilled this vow. But it, there's a mystery here. Because I don't know if, is he drinking wine with us? I mean, that's what we believe. That next time we come and we set a table here with wine. That you're drinking with Christ. Wine. Is this not the kingdom of, of the Father? I think he fulfilled that. As a matter of fact, right before he said the words, it is finished. Meaning, my work is done. I fulfilled my vow. He drank vinegar on the cross. What, what did he give? What, what was it that he vowed that only he could afford? Above his Nazarite vow was his life for you. Who else 
could give his life for you, that you might have righteousness, that you might then fulfill your vow as a Nazarite. He gave us entrance into the presence of God. Approach, approach the Holy of Holies now, you Nazarites. Follow Christ, the perfect Nazarite. That's what he says. He himself, Jesus himself calls you to something that sounds exactly like a Nazarite vow. Look at what he says. If anyone comes to me, Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. We've talked about this. This is it. This is that relationship priority, separation. Yes, and even his own life. Oh, he's talking about my whole lifestyle. If I don't do that, he cannot be my disciple. Cannot. If you are, don't kid yourself. Jesus did not stop in giving his life on the cross so that you could be a Nazarite. He called you to be one. Are you one? Follow him. You cannot be a disciple of Christ if you're not living the way of the Nazarite, as we've talked about. Separation and consecration. Faith in the sacrifices. Following the perfect Nazarite. We got one more thing to do. It's going to take two minutes. But we need to do this. Open your Bible. In Philippians. Chapter 3. Verse 8 through 21. We're going to read it quickly. But what you're going to see before you is the illustration. Of everything that I just said. There is a man. Like you and I. Who had a Nazarite vow. Who, who lived this in his life. Let's see how he did it. It's the Apostle Paul. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Read there with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you follow. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Did you see that? I want to be closer to God. I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying I want to do that because I'm perfect. And then he continues. But the righteousness I have is that which comes through faith. Oh, this is just like a Nazarite. Faith in who? In Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him. In the power of his resurrection. And that I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, <laughs> I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And then verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. But what do I do? I press on to make it my own. Why do I do that? Because Christ Jesus had made me his own. This is exactly like the camp. I'm calling you to be a Nazarite. Why? Because you're mine. I've already shown you that you're mine. I, I brought you here. You belong to me. Now come. Come closer. Make me your own as I have made you my own. 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. There it is. It's an aspiration. I am moving in that direction. I have not arrived there. I am moving there, though. I am moving west. I am moving towards the garden. I am moving. I am moving west. I press on towards the goal. Verse 14. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise... Are you thinking otherwise? Well, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, verse 17, join in imitating me. The Apostle Paul says, imitate me. Follow me into the tent of meeting. Towards the Holy of Holies, imitate me. Keep your eyes 
on those who walk according to the example you have in us. And I would say it's the Nazarite example. It's the disciple of Christ. Verse 18. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Those who are not in the way of the Nazarite, did you catch that? If they are not moving west, if they are not aspiring to closeness to God and moving as a disciple into the tabernacle, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. They are not Christians. They are not disciples. Their end, verse 19, is destruction. Their God is their belly, is wine. Their God is wine. Their, they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. They want to live in the wilderness and they want to go back to Egypt. But, but, beloved, what is our citizenship? Verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. And from heaven we wait a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies or our lowly body, to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And on that day, just like you read the story of the, the, the law of the Nazarite, you know what we're going to do that day? We are going to drink wine face to face with Jesus. That's the way of the Nazarite. Do you want to be close to God? Do you want to be closer to God? The only way is the way of the Nazarite. Separation and consecration. Faith in the sacrifices. Following the perfect Nazarite. There is no other way. And I'm telling you this. Because I, I presume this is the thing you want most. Is to be closer to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Oh Lord. For those of us who, who wish that, who desire that. For those of us who, who want to be in your presence forever and closer and closer to you. Who want to just fall in your presence and just eat with you. And just feel your closeness right now, even now in our lives. Lord, give us. Give us strength that we may follow the way of the Nazarite, that we may make vows, that we may live separate lives to you, that we may believe in the sacrifice Jesus did for us, and that we may follow him, who is the perfect Nazarite and who opened for us the way into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, Let's respond to the preaching of the word of God. Let's sing together. Holy, holy, holy. And let's sing verses 1 and 4. Verses 1 and 4. Okay?
Well, you may be seated. It's a very good occasion right now. Doe, could you come here? Uh, right here so I can speak in the microphone and people can see you and whatnot. We, talk, we just talked about vows and about making vows. Well, Doak is here to make some vows. Doak is joining our church today. Well, he has joined our church, and now we're presenting him to you as a member of the church. And by we, I mean the session, the elders. Doak has professed his faith before us. He had been previously baptized. And uh, uh, if you, if you want to know how to join the church, it's, not, it's really not that hard. You just fill out a form saying, I want to join. And then you take a course, an information course on what's up with Covenant Presbyterian Church. What is this thing? And then after that, uh, you appear before the session, the elders, and you just talk to us about your faith. And then you make vows. You make vows. All of you, if you have joined the church, you have made vows. And right now, you get to remember those vows. And just like a good Nazarite, just like a good disciple of Christ, these vows are not saying, oh, you are so good. You did it. You are doing it perfectly. No, these vows are to remind you that you have a sacrifice. And you are here because you are following the perfect Nazarite. You're following Christ. You get to renew your vows. You could, do, you could do that every Sunday. And right now, you get a chance to do that. So, Doak, I'm going to ask you for these questions. And you're going to answer so these people can hear that you do. Okay? So here are the vows. These are your vows if you're members of the church as well. Pay attention to them. Do you acknowledge yourselves or yourself, Doak? To be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure, and without hope, save in his sovereign grace, mercy, do you? I do. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you? I do. Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit, that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ, do you? I do. Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability, do you? I do. Do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace, do you? I do. Well, beloved, as, as we walk out of here today, if you would be so kind and receive Doak then as a member of Covenant Presbyterian Church. He is now one flesh with you. He is part of the body. He is your brother by the blood of Christ. He is family. And you know, you don't choose family, guys. So you just love him. <laughs> just love him like Jesus loves you. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks because you build the church. To the power and reign of your son, your work, by, pro by the prophetic word, you will continue to expand. Lord, the vows that Doak has made and the vows that we have made as members of the church are very lofty. And we are making them before you in your presence. Ah, Lord, thank you for reminding us that we are not making these vows because we, we think anything of ourselves, but we come just like we read a few minutes ago, just like Paul. We count on the righteousness of Christ. It is by faith, but we forget what's behind, and we move ahead. We forge ahead. We look at him. We, are, we have our sins forgiven and cleansed time and time and time again. We start over, and we keep our eyes on him. We leave everything behind. Because we want that day. We want to be closer to you. We will walk in your presence one day. Our bodies will be risen from the dead. We will drink rich wine at your very table. So, Lord, help us to fulfill these vows. Help Dope to fulfill these vows. For your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Dope, thank you very, very much. Just sit down. Okay, now we continue in worship, thanksgiving, 
obedience to Christ with the giving of the tithes and offerings of the ushers. Please come ahead. And while they do that, there's a few announcements for you there uh, in your worship guide. We have a summer schedule. That's where we're in. Uh, the men's Bible study is currently on hold during the summer. Uh, the men's Bible study uh, happens in the first and third Saturday of uh, the month in Zoom and in person, and the date when we will resume is right there for you. And uh, Wednesday nights at Covenant, we are also with a summer schedule. We usually get together here for dinner and then Bible study. We have some uh, ideas for what might happen on September 7th. We are in discussion of those with the elders. Uh, the, the session is talking about that. And uh, we will meet again in, in person then on Wednesday nights on September 7th. And don't be discouraged. Those of you who have been reading, plowing through the Bible, I mean, you're just going. You, and some of you have made that vow, I'm going to read through the Bible, and you fell behind, just like many Nazarites before you. <laughs> so what do you do? Oh, you trust Christ. You know, vowing to read Scripture, it's not like vowing not to sin. I, I hope that many of you have, uh, you've done that already, okay? That's not a Nazarite vow. Stop sinning. You, you've already done that. You, you are committed to hating and forsaking your sins. When you sin, you come to Christ and you say, forgive me. You repent. What you do in here is like, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. I'm going to do this. And some of you are behind. I know. Because I've been behind. What do you do in that circumstance? You start over. If you're behind, the passage you're going to read today starts on Psalm 140. You just pick up right there and you start reading. So the schedule is there for you. We're doing that together. And it's been part of our year so far. So if you are just a visitor and wants to join us in that, that's where you begin. And uh, who knows? Maybe we'll do it again next year. We'll see. With that, let me pray in thanksgiving. And we'll sing the doxology and receive the blessing of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is you who give us all good things. No work would happen here if you hadn't provided, if you hadn't saved us, if you hadn't given to us from your bountiful hand, from the hand of the one who owns all things. We receive from your hand all these good gifts. Lord, but hear our prayer, hear our cry, that you would continue to provide for our every need, that we would have bread on our tables, Lord, and we would have resources with which to do the work of the church. Lord, help us in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's give glory to God then. Let's stand and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. the blessing of the Lord, which is the passage I'm going to be preaching on next Sunday. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.